Well, good morning. It is an absolute pleasure to finally come and see where it is that Philip spends his days. It is a wonderful place. Thank you, Thank you for that welcome. I'm really grateful for that. I flew in last night. It was dark, and I woke up this morning, opened the curtains, and I saw how blessed you are just to see hills. It is just remarkable. And yes, Philip got the raw end of the deal this weekend. <laughs> He is actually at a church that's just a few miles away from where I live. That's how ironic it all is. And I know you're blessed uh, by not just the hills and the weather, but by having Philip and June as your par ministry couple here. Uh, Certainly, it's been a pleasure to get to know Philip over the years, and uh, just delighted to see how he proclaims God's Word across the nation from this very pulpit in an unapologetic way in a very winsome way as well. So I am also blessed this morning because this is the only church that I have ever visited in the U.S. where I don't have to get you all to figure out what I'm saying, <laughs> you know. And you all know that I'm not uh, Conor McGregor. Most people think I am because I sound like him. And I'm not Alistair Begg. And the other one that gets uh, thrown at me from time to time after they think about it, they go, you sound like someone. Who do you sound like? They, they, they usually uh, come off with Shrek. So <laughs> you're people who sound like Shrek. Sound like, not look like Shrek, sound like Shrek. It's great. And so thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to open up God's Word. Today I want to talk to you about the blessed life. The blessed life. Uh, yes, even in these very, very difficult days, Uh, God's blessing is within reach. It's very accessible. Uh, And when I say the blessed life, I'm not talking about how you can get more stuff and how you can retire early and get financial security and play a little bit more golf, even though there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves. They're definitely not at the top of God's priority list when it comes to the blessed life. I want to talk to you about the blessed life as he defines it in Psalm 133. Wonderful uh, description of blessing there. Very familiar psalm uh, that, that you will have come across in the past if you've been knocking around church for a little while. And I want to talk to you about the key that's there that unlocks God's blessing in a very important area of your life, human relationships, social interactions. You will spend most of your days in some sort of social sphere of activity, interacting with people around you. Well, God wants to bless that, and Psalm 133 provides the key that unlocks that blessing. I'm a blessed man, I believe, uh, not just because I got to see the hills today and get out of Texan weather, but because I have a, a godly wife, and I have four kids that I love, They're a great 13-year-old girl, 11-year-old boy, 9-year-old boy, 5-year-old boy. So it's a a busy little household. And I even have a dog. Now, I'm not sure if that's a blessing just yet or not. I'm I'm neither here nor there with the dog at the minute. Uh, but, But he has brought a lot of joy to our family life. And because of COVID restrictions, I've been able to spend a lot of the last year playing Uno. You know the card game Uno? with my five-year-old. And I tell you what, Netflix does not have anything on the entertainment that he provides through a good game of Uno on a regular basis. I mean, when you see his smile, because he has a pickup four that he's going to launch. Those of you who know Uno know that's that's the one you want to have. He's going to launch it my way. It's just pure bliss. I love it. (laughs) But family life and parenting and work life, and school life, college life, church life, can very, very quickly turn from from a blessing to a bleak situation rather rapidly. Uh, Just to give you a few examples in the arena of parenting, that sphere of social interaction that I'm right in the thick of at the minute, given the age of my kids, I, at the minute, have to set a timer to gauge how long each child gets to cuddle the dog. Because I'm tired of being accused of being an unfair tyrant. 
that's not fair is all I ever get. And I, I tell you, I give wonderful why you don't understand what fairness is speeches to my kids. And they're brilliant, but they go in one ear and they go out the other ear. These days I'm having to resort to, at family prayer time, I'm having to resort to a good old-fashioned game of rock, paper, scissors, shoot, to figure out who gets to pray first, to avoid the conflict uh, of that. It, 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 it's crazy, and, and I, can't, I can't just look at the kids and say, you know, you're the cause of the conflict in our home. I am often the reason why there's tension too. I get frustrating. I'm the one that needs the key that unlocks God's blessing in our home life. Not too long ago, my 13-year-old daughter announced to me as we were heading out to drop the kids off at school that it was her turn to provide snacks at her Bible study that morning. It's a little Christian school in the neighborhood, and it seems it was her turn. I said, well, okay, you could have given me more notice. I'm about to drop you off. But I, I'm a pragmatic guy. I said, oh, grab a bag of apples there, or a bunch of bananas. And I mean... It was, a, it was a, an immediate, no way. <laughs> Dad, when it's your turn to bring snacks, you bring donuts. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what a sweet deal these kids have orchestrated. <laughs> but again, trying to be the bigger man, I said, okay, let's get into the car. Stopped off at a donut shop right beside the school. Perfect place to put a donut shop beside a Christian school. I mean, they're making a fortune there. <laughs> And so I go in and uh, I asked her, you know, how many donuts do you need? She says, two dozen. 24 donuts. And I'm thinking, 24 donuts, that's upwards of $20. And I don't even get a donut out of this. This is, this is not going well. And so my, my temperature is beginning to rise a little bit. But again, bigger guy. I order, I'm about to pay. And as I'm about to pay, I kind of ask her somewhat randomly, hey, love, you know, how many woman in the word warriors are going to gather around your Bible study today. And she goes, six. <laughs> now, that's not very complicated maths, <laughs> right? Six. That's, 20, that's 24. That's four donuts a child. 13-year-old <laughs> girls just after breakfast. I kid you not, I went from Bible study supporter, patron, sponsor to Bible study persecutor <laughs> in an instant. My temperature boiled. I snapped. And I said things I shouldn't have said to my daughter because I was annoyed. And I raised my voice publicly in ways that I shouldn't have raised my voice publicly. Because she frustrated me. And I wasn't going to have it. It ruined our day. It ruined her day. It ruined my day. It ruined our daddy-daughter relationship. All that day. When she got home, I, I had words with her. I apologized. She did too. Um, we hugged it out. All was well. But it was a ruined and a lost day that didn't have to go that way. Not too long after that, uh, we headed out to Costco's together. And I was at the self-checkout point, and I handed her a, a jar of basil and garlic tomato pasta sauce to scan on the scanner there. And wouldn't you know, she guided it like a guided missile out of her hand right onto my toe. And the jar exploded and covered me in garlic and basil tomato sauce from the waist down and I was wearing flip-flops that day. <laughs> you ever been baptized in garlic and basil tomato sauce? Horrible feeling. I, I can't smell the stuff now. It's horrible. I, mean, I can't have pasta with tomato sauce. But I snapped again. I lost it with her publicly. I said things that I shouldn't have said. I reacted in a way I shouldn't have reacted just because I was mad. I lost my temper. I lost my patience. That daddy-daughter relationship wasn't the same that day again, another day. I did it. It was my fault. Conflict, relational tension, 
disunity doesn't just sit in parenting spheres of life, right? It, it spills over into spousal relationships. It spills over into uh, workplace relationships, church relationships. I, I don't know what it's been like here in California other than what gets uh, sort of funneled our way through the news. But I, I am tired of what this has done to many local fellowships in Texas. Mask. A mask. Half of the congregation are mad at the other half for wearing it. That other half are mad at this other half for not wearing it. And all of the congregation is mad at the pastor for not using the pulpit to advance their particular perspective on masks. It's ridiculous. This is the church of Jesus Christ. I read a a little old poem not too long ago, and it captures it beautifully. It says this, To live above with the saints that we love, oh, wouldn't that be glory? To just be up there with the Lord, with all you, wouldn't that be glory? But goes on to say, but to live below with the saints that I know, that's another story. <laughs> Captures it quite well. It's wise words there. That's an experienced poet. So how do we enjoy daily life without it becoming family feuding? How, how do we enjoy the relationships in which we move in a way that it activates and it creates an environment where God shows up to bless rather than remove himself from. Well, I think the key to that is found in Psalm 133. And and I know I need, and I submit to you, you may need a good daily dose of Psalm 133 so that we as God's people get along and can shine, can be salt that does not lose its saltiness, can be a light that is positioned Uh, for all to see, which is precisely God's will for this community. Society flourishes when God's people get along. Don't don't ask me why God has designed it that way, but but in, in the mystery of God, He's designed it so that His purposes are accomplished in the 21st century through His people. So let's, let's walk through Psalm 133. Let me show you what's there. I think you will find it just a beautiful psalm. Look with me at verse 1. Verse 1 presents uh, the point of the entire psalm up front. It is there, verse 1. This is what this psalm is about. And it's a celebration. There's no doubt about it. But it's also an invitation for you to enter into that type of life that should be celebrated. Look what it says, verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity or in harmony. This is an emotional outburst of joy, an expression of delight. But it also is cast toward us as a vision for a future that you should step into, that you should aspire to to bring down into your relationships. In that first verse, we're talking about how good and how pleasant it is to live like that. That's two hows. Now, I don't know what translation of the scriptures you're using. Some have it expressed this way, how good and pleasant, as if pleasant is just qualifying good, but it's the same thing. But that's not the case. The the actual text there has how good and how pleasant. There's two things going on here. Two observations that you should note. It's good. That means it's proper. That means it's right. It is morally right by God's design when life is lived like that. And it is enjoyable. It is pleasant. It is pleasurable when life is lived like that. How good, how proper, how right, how pleasant, how pleasurable it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity and harmony. This psalm is really rooted in the Israelite home. Its roots are just the basic uh, structure, family unit of society, the home. It it has uh, 
roots in Deuteronomy, where, where God's giving his people some guidance about life under him. Uh, and there is where it emerges from. But when it comes to us in Psalm 133, it comes to us as a collection of psalms. If you look at the top of that psalm and whatever translation you're using, it might have something like this, a psalm of ascent or a pilgrim psalm. Psalms 120 to 134 are, are a little tiny psalter inside of the Hebrew psalter, a little collection of pilgrim songs. This one, rooted in the home, actually finds its life when it comes to us in the family of faith, not just the blood family, but the family of faith, church life. This is a song that God's people, when they gathered three times a year to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, this is a song they would have sung. How good and how pleasant it is when, when we dwell together as God's people in unity and harmony. It's a beautiful psalm of ascent. It celebrates harmony with your blood family, and it celebrates harmony with your faith family. And I know you understand what I mean by faith because of Philip de Courcy. And if you're a guest, what I mean is faith. F-A-I-T-H. Faith family. Now, unity and harmony doesn't mean that we all need to look the same, dress the same, have the same haircuts wear the same sneakers, like the same stuff, like garlic and basil tomato sauce on our pasta. No, harmony and unity has built into it, welcomes diversity. It celebrates our differences, that we're not just individuals, but we're distinct individuals with different personalities. I think your praise group here every Sunday provides you with a wonderful example of what the scriptures mean by harmony. Massive diversity, different genders, different backstories, different instruments, different voices, different roles to play, but they come together with one core purpose in mind. It's to lead you in the praise of God who deserves to be praised. Amen. And they do it really effectively, don't they? Yes. So harmony welcomes diversity around a common core. And that common core, of course, for us is the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 1 lays it all up front. It is right. It is proper by God's design. And it is pleasant. It is pleasurable by God's design. When life in your home, with your kids, with your spouse, when life in this church, when life in your work functions in harmony, God wants that. God wants that. So it celebrates that, but it also invites you to step into it, as I said earlier. Look at the little word that launches this entire psalm off at the very start there of verse 1. It's behold. Behold. There's some of you are looking at me going, that's not in my Bible, sir. Uh, it is in the Hebrew Bible, and, and I understand why translations will at some points remove some languages, some words that perhaps are a bit more archaic uh, in our common English parlance today. Right? When's the last time somebody stepped up and said, Good morning? Behold, did you see the wind out there today? You'd all be going like, what planet did this guy come down from? No, you'd, 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 say, you know, you'd say, good morning, isn't it windy out there? That word behold isn't that common in English anymore. And so, understandably so, some translations remove it. But I have a bit of an objection to that here Amen. in Psalm 133. Amen. <laughs> I've got one, one who's passionate about it with me. Amen. And the reason is this, that that is the only direct command to the reader of this psalm. That's the only time you're actually told to do something. So do me a favor, add behold to your copy of the scripture if it's not there, or circle it if it is there, because it's very important. It is, it is a term that adds emotion. Uh, it adds this excitement and expectation to what is about to be declared in the psalm, but it is a direct command, and it simply means this, look here. 
Fix your attention here. Focus on this. Watch this. Watch what? How good. How pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. This is not just a celebration. This is an invitation to enter into a certain type of life that's very accessible to you every day. You see, my friends, what I believe is going on here is an expression of God's vision for the world. God's vision for the world was always that there would be harmony in your world. God's vision for his world has always been that there would be unity and harmony in your social interactions. It's the way he set it up. If you read Genesis 1 and 2, the creation accounts, here's what you're going to find that... uh, God creates a world that is extremely diverse, and yet it functions in harmony by his design. And he declares it good, and he declares it good, and he declares it good, 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 very good. Same word as we have in Psalm 133. And then on the seventh day, he figuratively speaking puts his feet up, to rest, not because he's exhausted, but because he wants to enjoy the pleasure of his good world functioning as he designed it to function all along. It is good and pleasant when God's world operates as he designed it to operate, which includes when brothers and sisters dwell together in harmony and in unity. That's the right way to live. That's the pleasurable way to live. It's what God wanted from the start. God's vision for the world is that there be harmony in your world. Now, that's the point. But then he provides us, the psalmist provides us with two very helpful pictures, two visuals, two very helpful pictures to to capture how wonderful that type of harmonious living is like. Uh, Sort of to entice you in, a little bit of candy, right? To lure you in. It could be like this. Let me help you see them. Verse 2. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron. Running down on the collar or edges of his robes. Verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. I know, I know you all enough, because you're probably not that different to me. I know you all enough to know that you're sitting there thinking, how on earth would anybody ever describe those as two helpful pictures? <laughs> like, how does that help me go, yeah, I sure want to live like that? I mean, what we have is a, is a scruffy, bearded man covered in oil, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, I, I know beards are back in. Uh, so pardon me if you're offended by that, but, but generally speaking, beards can be scruffy and they can be messy. And certainly in this one, it seems this guy, Aaron, is bathed in what I can only imagine is cooking oil. It probably f- smells like a French fry. That's, that's not the kind of world I want to inhabit. And then who on earth is Herman? Right? The only Herman I know is Herman Munster. And and I'm sure he didn't make it into Psalm 133 or any psalm. What on earth is going on here? Why provide us with those two analogies to entice us into that type of living when they're so baffling? Well, let let me help you out here. Visual number one in verse two, the oily bearded man. The psalmist zooms in on a very specific person in a very specific role. It's the high priest Aaron. The highest conceivable holy person in the Israelite system at the time was the high priest. And not just any high priest, Aaron as the high priest. And Aaron's not sitting at home, you know, watching the news with his feet up. And he's not in the backyard, you know, doing a little bit of garden work. He's robed in his worship garments. He's being prepared to act as a mediator between the people of God, Israel, 
and God. To represent them before him. To represent him before them. This is Aaron being readied for service. That oil's not cooking oil. That oil is extremely expensive, fragrant, ceremonial anointing oil. He's been saturated in the stuff because of what he is about to do. When I read that, I think of the pleasure that nice, expensive, moisturizing cream um, feels like on dry skin. It's, it's pleasant, it's pleasurable, and it fulfills a purpose. Here's what this picture is saying. Here we have a, a man ready to head to toe for sacred service to God. Harmony in your home. Harmony in your relationships here is like a sacred service to God is what that image is saying. Think about that. Is a sacred service to God is an act of worship. Amen. When you get along here and at home, worship God. You worship God. Now look at visual number two, verse three. We zoomed in in verse two through the high priest Aaron. Now we zoom out. Uh, this visual kind of goes more of a national analogy as opposed to a, sort of a personal analogy. Uh, verse uh, three, the Jew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Sion. That type of harmonious living with those around you is like the Jew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Here we have drier and war warmer, lower regions of Israel being refreshed, being cooled down by the highest peaks in that part of the land, Mount Hermon. That's, that's it's a mountain. It's a, it's a range, but Mount Hermon is, is the highest peak. It, it, it's, it's supposed to convey the same feeling of refreshment that I get in Texas in the summers when I move from 100 degree weather outside into air conditioning inside. It just hits you and you go, Whew, praise God for air conditioning. How did these people live here 100 years ago without that? It puts a spring in your step. It puts a smile in your face. What the psalmist is doing is he's reaching for the highest conceivable expression of morning moisture available to him at that time. It's the moisture that seems to be coming all the way down from the highest peak in the land. That's the good dew that you want to have in the morning. That's the thickest, uh, wateriest type of moisture available, which is essential in an agricultural society, in a farming society. Think about it. When that type of watering system occurs, the land flourishes. The land produces what the land was designed to produce. To them, this is a picture of bliss picture of a society that's flourishing because it's wet and it can produce life. My friends, harmony in your home and harmony in this church is not just a sacred act of worship to God. It is also a refreshing service to society. To everyone around you, Mum is blessed, dad's blessed, brothers and sisters are blessed, work colleagues are, are blessed, fellow parishioners are blessed, your pastor is blessed. When brothers and sisters dwell together in harmony and unity. Now, verse 3, the end of verse 3 provides us with the reason why. Now, this is getting very important at this point. The purpose for this. Why, why does that type of living, interactions in our relationships uh, unlock s such a blessing upon everyone. Well, verse 3b, the second half there, gives us the answer to that. Uh, take a look at it with me. It says this, for there, or because there, the Lord has commanded the blessing. Life 
forevermore. For there, the Lord has decreed or decided upon. He's not going to go back on it. This is happening. For there, the Lord has decreed the blessing. Not a blessing, the blessing. Definite article. Life, life forevermore. The word there is hugely important. That's why I'm emphasizing it. Underline it if you do that in your Bible or circle it. Uh, I like to do that. It helps me go back to that psalm and, and know what was important. Uh, that, that, that word there is essential. And it legitimately points in two directions to get the referent behind it. Where is the there? What's the there in 3b? Well, it points, in one place it points to is verse 1. The thematic referent. Uh, the, the, the concept of harmony and unity amongst people. There, when there's harmony and unity amongst God's people, God shows up and unlocks blessing. Now, let me be very, very clear. Uh, I'm not sure if you're tracking with me. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying there is that when Pastor Murphy does not go buck mad at his daughter for a donut scam, <laughs> that God shows up and blesses that dad-daughter relationship that day. And it doesn't go where I took it. I took it there. God didn't want me to take it there. And when I don't take it there, our relationship thrives that day. As he designed it to thrive, that's good. And that's pleasant for her, and it's pleasant for me. What I'm saying is that when I don't go buck mad because a jar of pasta lands on my toe, and Costco, and don't say things that I shouldn't say, and don't raise my voice the way I shouldn't raise my voice, that God shows up, and the rest of that day, daddy and daughter have the relationship that we're supposed to have. In the context of harmonious relationships, God unlocks the blessing of his own presence so that life can flow the way life is supposed to flow. God's not going to bless conflict. He's not. God's not going to bless infighting. God's not going to bless a home that is continually squabbling and fighting. God's not going to bless a church that is at each other's throat continually. And certainly society's not going to flourish in that part of the world either. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I get that, uh, Jonathan. Uh, you know, I, I follow. I get it. But here's the tricky problem. That's not what pops out of me by default when jars fall on my bare toes. And when I uncover a donut scam amongst 13-year-old girls or when I have to manage prayer time with rock, paper, scissors, shoot. It doesn't pop out of me naturally also when to my own... Uh, uh, full confession here, when my wife sends me to Hobby Lobby. <laughs> First time I went to Hobby Lobby, I mean, it was like a lamb to the slaughter. <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I, I was in the area having lunch with a buddy of mine. She knew I was there. She phones and says, hey, listen, I can't get down there, but Hobby Lobby's across the street. Can you go in there and get me some stuff? It's 80% discount. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, no problem. I go in there, and I'm confronted with the mightiest, uh, most numerous, godly woman warriors that I have ever encountered in my life, all wrestling with me to, to get these little signs that you can decorate your house with, right? Jesus signs, or, or, or signs with words that say, gather, or blessed. You know, I, I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I got home, and I was mad. I got some stuff for her, but I still thought, my goodness, never again. <laughs> See, it, it doesn't pop out of me naturally to step into that type of world that God blesses with those around me uh, unless something happens in my life that day. And I believe this psalm provides you with that something that happens, the key that unlocks the blessing. And it's back to that word, there. I told you that one of the places that there 
refers back to is verse 1, harmonious relationships. The other place it points toward grammatically is a few words before it. There, meaning on the mountains of Zion. On the mountains of Zion, the Lord has decreed, commanded, decided upon, not a blessing, but the blessing. The blessing of life, not any life, life that's everlasting. Zion, you know well, is another word, a synonym in its functional use of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, that place which, which God chose to manifest his presence in the progress of history. God's gone to great measures to be among us. But he can't be among us in light of his holy character and in light of our condition. And so his plan of redemption includes uh, him showing up somewhere. And Jerusalem played a key role in that. Zion is the place from which God decreed that he would provide the blessing of life forevermore. And what occurs on Zion is the only pathway forward for us to be able to enter into our days and have harmonious relationships with those around us, beginning with our family and extending out towards our blood and faith family and on into society. What I'm saying is that long before Jesus arrived, I believe this psalm, <coughs> excuse me, was, was pointing toward him. That there's a prophetic element to this psalm that this psalm is, is preparing God's people for what was going to come further on down the timeline of history, which is the appearance of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom alone is harmonious relationships possible between man and God and between man and man. That's why God picked those two very baffling pictures to launch our way. Like, you know, a, a bearded priest... Moisture from Mount Hermon. You've got to understand that in the progress of history and as the New Testament begins to explain to us some of the implications of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, high priest becomes very significant. Hebrews very clearly tells us that Jesus Christ is our high priest from a better order than the Aaronic order. 1 Timothy 2 tells us that Jesus, as our high priest, is the only mediator, the only real mediator. It's not Aaron between mankind and God. Mark 14 has a beautiful story of a lady who comes to prepare Jesus for what he is about to do with his death on the cross. John 12 tells us that same story. There's a little difference in both of them. They don't, they don't contradict each other. They just fill in the broader story a little bit better together. In Mark 14, this lady anoints Jesus' head with expensive, fragrant perfume to prepare for him for his act of service to God and to us. In John 12, we're told that this lady actually anointed Jesus' feet. But when you put them together, you realize that Jesus actually that night was anointed head to toe. He was saturated in his preparation to function as humanity's representative before God. He is our high priest. John 17, the upper room discourse, at the very end of it, in John 17, Jesus is presented as a high priest and he prays. We call it the high priestly prayer. You know what he prays about? Unity among God's people. Harmony. Amen. That they would be one. But echoes Psalm 133, of course. Remember the highest conceivable point that the Israelite could think of moisture descending from. The, the highest peaks in, in Mount Hermon, down to, 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 to Zion. Uh, New Testament makes it very, very clear 
that Jesus is God and that Jesus as God came from the highest conceivable place imaginable, the very throne room of God, so that he could do a work in Zion, which is why 1 Peter 2 says that Christ's laid a foundation, a cornerstone in Zion. Prophetic uh, uh, echoes here, I think, are enormous. Now, if all of that was too complicated for you and understand that it could be, uh, here's what I'm saying. Psalm 133 calls you to enjoy the blessing of great relationships with those around you because God blesses harmonious relationships there because God can do that in light of what he has done there, Zion, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God has worked in the Lord Jesus Christ, harmonious relationships are possible again within reach, accessible to the people of God if they choose to walk that path in Christ. So what's the key to God's blessing in our daily lives within our relationships? It's simply this, Jesus Christ and his work in Zion. Jesus Christ and his work in Zion. So I leave you with the only direct command. This is why I'm so passionate that you scribble it into your Bible. That's available in the psalm. Behold him. It's back to look. Fix your gaze upon. Focus on. Watch. Watch what? Watch what happens there. Where? Zion person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the high priest who mediates God's blessing of life, life forevermore to those who receive it. My friends, you will uphold in your life what you behold in life. What you watch is what you end up wanting. What you look at is what you end up loving and pursuing. And I see no better way of successfully navigating my day well with all the emails and all the bad attitudes and all the donut scams and, and frozen temperature in Texas and I was sitting in the car for three days to keep warm and all that that brings out of us, I have no way of successfully navigating jars that fall on my toes and Hobby Lobby wrestling except it being the result of me having spent time beholding Him. Amen. Every day, looking to Him, Amen. fixating my attention upon him. He's the key that unlocks God's blessing in your relationships, which is where you spend most of your existence. We have a decorative sign from Hobby Lobby, 80% off, <laughs> that sits just underneath the television in our living room. And it says this, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. You know what that sign does to me every morning I get up early? It stops me from reaching for the remote control and putting on the television and watching the news and getting mad at everybody. It stops me beholding that. And it reminds me that I need to spend a little bit of time with the Lord today. If this day is going to be the best day possible for my daughter and for my wife and for my three boys... And for my colleagues, and even for the dog, the dog gets a little bit more better food, I guess. My friends, unless you behold him regularly, there is no way that you're going to successfully step into what this psalm celebrates. And if we're going to be a light in this part of the world, and, and salt does not, does not lose its saltiness, that's precisely what we need to do. Behold Jesus Christ. I don't know, I can't speak for you, I can only speak for myself. I think that when I sleep, my default reset is to become me-centered. And I need to counter that in the power and in the strength of the Holy Spirit every day by beholding Him. See, when I behold Him and what He has done for me and what He has done for us, I don't leave that five, ten minutes impressed with myself wanting to make sure that everybody bows the knee to me, I leave wanting to proclaim him, to live a grateful life as an act of worship 
to him, and that affects everybody around me. So my friends, I leave you with that. Next time you moisturize your hands, or if you live in, uh, or you go to places that are very, very hot and experience the blessing of air conditioning, remember Psalm 133. How good, right, proper, how pleasant, pleasurable it is for you and everybody around you when you live in unity with those who are there, when you behold the Lord Jesus Christ on a regular basis. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Psalm 133 and, and what it teaches on so many levels and even, I think, forward in preparing us for the only means of blessing truly being available, which is the work in light of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for this fellowship in this needy state that you would do a work in them, that you do a work through them, and that they would be able to stand before you one day and say, we, we did our best because we love you, Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray and gather. Amen.